the stereochemistry of the Diels-Alder reaction is probably the most complicated aspect of this process, but luckily there is a simple approach that will give you the correct answer every single time. Let me explain. Let's start by looking at this reaction. There are two possible products here. One on the left is the molecule that we'll be referring to as the endoproduct, and the other one on the right, that one is going to be the exoproduct. In terms of the nomenclature, the exoproduct is going to be the one where our electron withdrawing groups, these guys, are further away from the bridge with a double bond, and the endoproduct is the one where our electron withdrawing groups are closer to the bridge with the double bond. The endoproduct in the diels alder reaction is typically going to be the major product, and this is known as the endo rule. And you might be wondering as to why, because the endoproduct looks like it is less thermodynamically stable, and indeed, in most cases, the endoproduct is, in fact, going to be less stable. The trick here is in the transition state. There is a significant difference in the nature of the transition states that yield endo and exo products. If we stack the molecules one on top of the other one, we can have two possible versions of this stacking. One version in which the molecules stack at an angle, what I have on the right, so they are not exactly one on top of each other, they are sort of like sliding one under the other one. So that one is going to be our exit transition state. While in the other case, on the left, my two molecules are literally stacking on top of each other like a sandwich. And the important difference here is going to be the presence of the secondary overlap between the diene and dienophile in the end the transition state, and that is when our molecules are completely sandwiched one on top of the other one. This secondary overlap makes the transition state more stable, lowering its energy. And the lower the energy of the transition state, the lower the activation energy of the reaction is going to be, and the faster the process is going to be overall. From the kinetic perspective, this means that the diels alder reaction favors the kinetic product, aka the one that forms the fastest. Or in other words, we can say that the diels alder reaction is kinetically controlled. But you might want to remind me that the diels alder reaction is an equilibrium, it's not a non-equilibrium process, and you would be absolutely correct, the deals older is indeed an equilibrium. However, this is a very slow equilibrium. This means that we're virtually never going to let this reaction reach that state of equilibrium. So while the exoproduct will be more thermodynamically stable, well, in most cases, it is going to be the minor product simply because we're always going to be stopping our reaction before it can reach the state of equilibrium. Now, drawing the transition state of the diels alder reaction is sometimes called the cube method, and it allows us to predict the stereochemistry of the product. And it is a cube method because the transition state kind of looks like a little cube. But drawing the transition state is a little bit tedious, and you are not going to have a ton of time on the test to draw the transition state every single time. So is there an easier way to approach it? I wouldn't bring it up if there wasn't one. But before we go over the trick, we need to go over a couple more terms. So let's look at this diene over here. It is already in the S cis conformation, so we don't need to rotate it around. However, if your diene is not in the correct S cis conformation, make sure you convert it to the correct conformation first. If you need a reminder, check my video on it and all the links are in the description below. Now, back to my example here. First, I'm going to number my atoms for easy reference points. So I have atoms 1, 2, 3, and 4. For the purposes of stereochemistry, we'll pay very close attention to groups on my atom number 1 and my atom number 4, because those are the ones that are going to end up with stereochemistry in the final product. I do have a couple of groups on the atoms number 2 and number 3, but frankly they are irrelevant, because they are sp2 hybridized now, and they will be sp2 hybridized in the final product anyways. So we are going to refer to the groups that are looking inside as the in-groups. In this case, it is just a couple of hydrogens that are looking inside of my molecule. The other two groups that are going to be looking away, those are going to be my out groups, and in this case it's a couple of methoxy groups. I have one on the bottom and another one on the top. And since we're working on the correct stereochemistry of specifically the endoproduct, because we know that the endoproduct is going to be the expected product of this reaction, the relationship that you want to memorize between the in and out groups and the electron withdrawing groups of the diena file is the following. The out 
out groups are going to be sys to the electron withdrawing groups on your Dana file in the endo product. And likewise, if you have in groups, the in groups are going to be trans to electron withdrawing groups of the Dana file. So how exactly are we going to use this information? Well, it's best to illustrate with an example. So I'm going to take my diin that I analyzed a moment ago and I'm going to react it with the following diina file. In this case, the nitriles are naturally going to be my electron withdrawing groups. And as we have established a moment ago, the methoxy groups are our out groups. While the hydrogens, I'm going to show them uh, here in green, uh, on the atoms 1 and 4 correspondingly, those guys are going to be my in groups. So to predict the correct product here, I am first going to draw the stem for the final product, which is going to be the six-membered ring, of course. Then I'm going to number it and add a double bond between atoms 2 and 3 where it should be. Then I'm going to add my nitriles to atoms 5 and 6. Since they are cis to each other in the starting material, I will have to also add them cis in the final product, and in this case, let's put them on the dashes because, you know, why not? Now, here is the very important part. As soon as I add my electron withdrawing groups to my molecule, doesn't matter if I choose to put them on wedges or dashes, I need to put the rest of the molecule together correctly in relation to those groups. And I know that my out groups must be cis to my electron withdrawing groups. I know that the out groups here are these methoxy groups. So these OCH3s that are going to be sitting on carbon number one and carbon number four over here, these guys got to be on the dashes as well. So when I put them on my molecule, I will do it just so. I can also indicate my hydrogens here on the wedges, but if you want to leave those as implicit hydrogens, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to show them for as long as it's just, you know, hydrogens and not other group. And finally, one last touch, I'll have to add my methyl groups to the atoms two and three. And remember how I said it's kind of irrelevant what those groups are. They were on the sp2 hybridized atoms here to begin with, and atoms two and three over here, they are still sp2 hybridized atoms so I didn't need to worry about the stereochemistry at that point. It was flat and it is still going to be flat. And there I have my product. This algorithm might seem a little tedious at first, but I can guarantee that once you do a few problems, it'll take you just a few moments to go through the steps and draw your product correctly every single time. Now, of course, organic chemists being who we are, we don't want to limit ourselves to just simple examples like the one that we just went over. Quite often, you're going to see reactions involving the formation of the bridged bicyclic products, and drawing those with the correct stereochemistry might be a little bit of a challenge. So, for example, let's look at this reaction here. I am reacting cyclohexa 13 diene with the corresponding methyl acrylate. Uh, in this case, the diene is obviously going to be, well, my diene, and my diene file is going to be my ester over here. And the issue that I'm going to run into with this example is the fact that now my in groups, they make a chain, they are connected to each other, which is a little bit of a problem because I will not be able to just put them on the dashes or wedges looking in the opposite directions in my final product. I would have to keep them connected. And so if I go through the steps that I have just described a moment ago and draw my final product, I would get something that looks like this. Notice how my in groups were connected to begin with and they are still connected over here in this bridge. And this molecule, this type of a representation is often going to be called a view from above because you're kind of looking at the molecule from above. And the important part here, as I've mentioned, is that the bridge that I draw, that, that bridge has to be shown very explicitly. You cannot show it something like, you know, something is sitting here, something is sitting there, and then somehow they are connected. That would be a very ugly picture. So if you have a bridge, you'll have to draw that inside just the way I did over here. Many instructors will be perfectly fine with this type of representation. However, some would require you to draw the molecule 
in the 3D representation, which is going to be something of this sort. This is going to be our side view, when we are looking at the molecule from the side, and the bridge, which I had represented over here with my wedges, is now sitting right over here, poking up. And while many instructors will be perfectly fine with your view from the above representation, it is still a very good idea to practice drawing these 3D structures, because some instructors and some standardized tests, they do require you to know how to operate with those guys. So now, assuming that you've watched my other tutorials on the deals the reaction, you are fully equipped to deal with any scenario that might come on your test or in the homework. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, boop that like button to help promote this video and help more students see it, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow.